Today's episode of the No Fun City Podcast is brought to you by Surfwheel. Surfwheel, providing a safe and fun way to surf on land. Check them out at surfwheel.com. Welcome to the No Fun City Podcast, episode 14. It's been a uh, couple months since we've had an episode, all due to this corona craze. And um, I've been avoiding doing an episode on Zoom but that's exactly what we're going to be doing today because we don't really have a choice anymore. Um, until this Corona stuff kind of goes away, we are stuck. And today, sitting with me, well, not directly with me, but somewhere in Vancouver is Chris. Chris, is your last name pronounced Turco or Turcot? Turcot. Okay. Do people make that mistake often or am I just that Frenchy? Well, no, so here's the fun thing. I get Turcote a lot. Oh, I'm like, wait, does that happen in the States a lot? No, here. Oh. It's specifically Vancouver. I'm from the prairies originally, and I yeah. got it a lot here in Vancouver. They're like, is it Turcote? I'm like, would that make me Italian? Or I'm not sure how that That's would. That's weird. Yeah. No, That's Turcot. Weird. Yeah. So thanks Chris, for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. So, Chris, you mainly deal in real estate, mortgages, that sort of thing. You do have a personal brand. Do you want to break down everything it is that you do for the people watching right now? Yeah, and uh, I'll attempt to do it as quickly as possible in respect of time. So <clears throat> business side, uh, business, business, Chris, is uh, I, I'm the president of Real Property Management, which is Canada's largest uh, property management franchise organization. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, we sell franchise property management businesses in a box. I always like to use the example of McDonald's, right? You buy a McDonald's, you don't have to worry about what's on the menu, the product, the marketing, nothing. It's in a box. So that's what we do. So we have uh, we have a real, real property management, property management offices coast to coast. So it's business number one. Business number two is Centum Financial Group, which is one of Canada's largest mortgage broker franchise organizations. Uh, we have just under 200 offices coast to coast, roughly about 2,000 agents. And we fund uh, we fund anywhere from four and a half to six billion dollars in annual mortgage volume uh, across the country. So that's me on the business side. Uh, on the personal side, I, I'm a, uh, I'm a I'm a proud husband and a dad. Got two little ones. Uh, but my whole thing from a personal brand standpoint, and we'll we'll dive deep, is uh, I I had one hell of a life where where uh, the cards and the odds were against me, and uh, I persevered. So that's not a bragging moment. That's a I just ripped that bandaid off and I'm very, I'm very raw and open with everything that happened to me in life. And my goal out of the personal branding content is uh, a lot of people resonate with it. And if somebody sees it for the first time and that's the, and that is the reason they decide not to give up that day, that's the mission. That's the flag on the hill. So that's my whole personal brand aspect about how it, you know, your success isn't predicated by your, your zip code or what hand you were dealt. You, you can rise beyond it and it doesn't define you just because that's where you started. Mm -hmm. So do you want to dive into this whole personal background of yours that sort of got you into this drive to become the Chris Turco that we know, or Turcot, I guess, that we know today? Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, it's always a challenge because it's, it's, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, respectfully give the Reader's Digest version. But uh, I, was, I was born to uh, older parents, so my dad... Uh, my dad had had a business and everything else, and he was uh, he had done the whole he had done the whole marriage thing before. Uh, I have six or seven step siblings that are in their sixties and everything else, else that I had uh, hadn't met or anything like that. And essentially, he was getting ready for retirement, and he married my mother, who was a thirteen year younger trophy wife. And uh, they got together because he was like, "I've done the kid thing, and I'm ready to cash out. I just want to travel, travel the world." world. And uh, uh, my, my mom, mom was like, that's, that's good. good. I can't I stand those little buggers. And, and so it was a match made in heaven. And about three, three weeks out before dad was ready for retirement. Whoops. <laughs> um, so I kind of ruined everything. So from like the earliest days, I remember arguments from, uh, from when I was like four years old and them arguing about the fact that I had screwed everything up. Oh, wow. They didn't, they didn't want me. I wasn't a part of the plan. This wasn't the life they signed up for, and now they're stuck with me. Like I, I remember those. Like it didn't make. You know when you get older in life, and then you get you're able to look back, and you're like, oh, that's what that meant. You know what okay. I mean? They don't. It doesn't hit the same way. But then as you age, you start to process. 
And then the laundry list, and we're not going to get into graphic detail, but like abused as a child, I was sent home. There was times I wasn't allowed to go home because guiding counselors were too scared to send me home because I'd come banged up and bruised. I was hospitalized. I was, I, my wow. dad was an abusive, bitter drunk that um, I screwed everything up and he had screwed up the first time and he thought he had a plan where that was all behind him. So I was a constant reminder that, well, it turns out his, he was going to be screwed all his life was his mm -hmm. mindset, right? So he took it out on me and uh, and he took it out on on, on my mother and uh, and I was an only child because like I said, I didn't really even know about the step siblings. And my dad was born in 34, so he'd be well into his 80s. So I grew up not even having grandparents or aunts or uncles. Like it was just these two humans that for all intents and purposes didn't want me. Yeah. My dad died on my 16th birthday like actually birthday cake on the Dang. hospital bed when I was 16. And that was an interesting moment. I talk about it through my personal branding and, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I do a lot of blogging about it on, on medium and everything else. And uh, the day my dad passed away, my mom had a PTSD stroke. So she lost all mobile, uh, like all mobility, speech, everything else. So there I was like in the hospital, sliding the wedding ring off dad's hand. And mom is being looked after by nurses because she's just gone completely blank. And I've got no one to call, like nobody. Um, so in that moment, it was like, there was a lot of bitterness. And, and I don't know how long firm we go, and we could do this in a number of sessions. So long story short, everything kind of went by the wayside. I became very bitter. I'm European, so I, I was raised Roman Catholic. Um, you know, So right away, it was like, well, there's no God, because there's no way a God would do that to somebody. So clearly, mm -hmm. God doesn't exist. So now I'm disheveled with that. Um, I may as well kill myself, because... 16 and really did like really it's over already like i don't want to go through the next 60 years of my life being a statistic mm -hmm. because i'm going to be a drunk or i'm going to be an addict or i'm going to be something because i've got no hope in hell of surviving um so what i would do is like grade 11 i would literally go to school i didn't tell anyone because i was already the trophy basket case the the kid that was abused and everything else so like i'll be damned if i'm going to tell them now i've got a mom at home that can't take care of me and in the small town, they only had two, they only had um, home care um, three times a week. So two days of the week, I wouldn't tell anyone. I would literally sprint from recess. I would sprint home, make sure my mom hasn't like thrown up on herself, choked, feed her something and change her adult diaper and then get back to work and then get back to well, work. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And then get back to school. And uh, so that was, that was, um, that was tough. Mom came out of it about a year later. Again, I'm trying to tell some speed of the uh, sake of time. But at 23, then mom died. Mom was the only thing I had left that uh, we grabbed, like, obviously in tra traumatic times like that, we bonded like like no other, and she was my everything. And then she passed away at 23, and that was it. I was, um, I was alone with, like, no plan, no nothing. And uh, my whole kind of thing that changed, I everyone always asked, what book did it? What inspirational video did it? Nothing. Um, I was, I, you know, my family, my dad owned the business. We had a little bit of money. Uh, when my mom passed away, uh, I rented two cars from a very, I think the biggest uh, uh, a car rental company in Canada. Uh, two brand new ones, wrote them both off. Um, uh, I was just destructive. I just, I didn't care. I was just doing stupid stuff. I was the guy at the bar every night that, what did I have to lose? Uh, you know, I was, I was paying everyone's tab every night. I was just anything I could do to be surrounded around people or be doing something so that I didn't have time in my own head to realize mm -hmm. how my life was over. I just didn't want to acknowledge it yet. And one night after a party, I, uh, that the next morning, waking up dehydrated, knowing, ignoring that little voice in the back of my head saying like, man, you're a loser. I was brushing my teeth, washing my face that morning, dehydrated as hell from the night before. No book, no movie. I just looked up and I was like, cool. You're going to do this for however much longer. The money's, money's going to run, run out. out. You, you already, already hate yourself, yourself and you're, you're going to end up killing yourself. yourself. And, and the, the way, way I'm wired, wired those that, that know me now, now I, I'm, I'm a very, like, I make a decision on the snap and, and I can be harsh, not in a malicious way, but I, I'm harsh on myself. It's it, like, it's black or white with me. So in that moment, I was like, well, let's not waste time. I might as well kill myself right now. And that was the thought. It was like, well, no, I'm not going to be a pain in the ass to everybody while I self-destruct for, for the next 12 months, 18 months. I'm going to kill myself right now. And because I'm black and white in that moment, I was like, no, that's not the answer. So I guess the bullshit stops. And from that day forward, <clears throat> I acknowledged the fact I was like, 
There's no trust fund waiting for me. There's no relatives that are going to cash out and make sure I'm okay. There is virtually no one in the world that's going to make sure that I'm okay. It's all on me, which means there's no room for excuses ever again. So since I was 23 years old, I have this at time unhealthy, unrelenting stream of motivation because I acknowledged very early on, there's no room for excuses in my life and it's all on me. I have no one to blame for how my life turns out, but me from that moment forward. And that's, that's the personal brand side. So that was the tipping point. That was the tipping point. It was like, either kill yourself or this stops. Like you can't have both. Mm-hmm. Why are you going to be that person that just lives in the middle? It doesn't make any sense. All right. So you obviously decided not to go down the road of killing yourself, thankfully. Yeah. Right. But okay. So you decide, okay, I need change in my life. What, like what happens next? Do you just like so, get up and go so I was job already... and be successful? Like how does <laughs> yeah. this happen? No, no, no. Yeah. No, yeah. That, the, the context helps. Right. So I was already going to university. I was on mm-hmm. academic and attendance probation constantly because I just didn't care. Um, university was the party, you know, I, I was always, I don't even know what the word is. Uh, I would never call myself intelligent because I just think that's arrogant. Um, school always came easy to me, but I was very bored. I was one of those disruptive kids. Yeah. And I don't know if you relate to that. You like, and me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and like I was always the there. class clown, but if you put a gun to my head and it was pass or fail, I'd always make sure I passed, yeah. even if I didn't put in the work. Right. Mm-hmm. So I knew that was in the back of my mind. And on my deathbed, uh, or on his deathbed, my dad, um, my dad couldn't speak the days leading up to his death because lungs and all this jazz. But my dad's friend, who was our uh, estate lawyer, basically explained to me, like, you promised, like, you have to promise your father on his deathbed, you're going to at least graduate university. You have to do that. So anyways, that how did I do it? I was already in university. I was borderline on my way of getting my ass kicked out. So doubled down on that right from that moment forward. I'm like, okay, I got to get this obligation. I knew school wasn't for me and I knew I, I, I have a commerce degree. I knew I wasn't going to follow that and I wasn't going to uh, go that route. And we could we could uh, talk a lot, but it, you know, school was the pain in the butt at that point. It was like, crap, I got to get that thing off the list. Promise, promise the big guy there was a lot of hatred there promised the big guy downstairs that i wasn't going to uh that, that i was going to pass so it was the annoyance so got it out of the way uh, i was already working for a bank at the time um and a bank that had given me a lot of leeway because of everything that had happened in life they gave me a lot of runway um so i just started going into this well what do i want to do and this is where the story i think kind of gets uh, interesting i'm a little biased of course um I looked at the landscape and I was like, well, what do I want to do? I sure as hell don't want to do anything to do with school. I was always entrepreneurial. I was selling stuff when I was a kid and flipping stuff and everything else. So something interesting happened when I realized I had nobody left in my life. I was like, well, I want to build a business. So the first business I built, which was a really, it was an auction site to basically compete against eBay because I had an illusion of grandeur. So uh, I was, you know, I, I had nobody around me. What's fascinating about our loved ones is sometimes they can be the thing that holds us back the most. Mm -hmm. You know, I just finished a commerce degree and I worked for the bank. Had I had any family around me, they would have been like, you got your degree and you work at the bank, put your head down for 30 years, collect your pension. And that's how life goes. Yeah. And that to me felt like I might as well go buy that gun again. Like that's how that felt. I was like, no, Mm -hmm. that's not going to happen. So then it allowed me to dream. And I was like, well, you know what? I want to be entrepreneurial. What if I could build an alternative to eBay? Well, I had nobody telling me not to do it, so I did it. And I ended up selling it uh, to a to a sub eBay company. Obviously, I'm not allowed when you sign these things, you're not allowed to non- disclose. Non- yeah, non- yeah, yeah. So I ended up selling that like eight months in for you know a, a good amount of money, uh, five almost six figures US kind of thing. And it was just a short little project. project. But that, that was, was the first step, step of, of wait a minute. There was, there was nobody to tell me not to do it. it. And, and it turns out it was pretty, pretty damn easy. easy. Mm-hmm. And then I started to, re- so the next thing on the list, I don't know how much digging you did before we did this, but uh, not everyone knows, but if you do some digging, you find it, unfortunately. I was a professional wrestler, like on television. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We so, had a pro wrestler on. Really? Who? Yeah. Ariane, uh, her name is Sloan. She's more on the independent scene. Okay. But yeah. Ariane Sealer, or si- Sealer, she's well, episode... 
I want to see. See, I'm I'm old now, man, so I don't know who was doing it. Who was doing she, it today? She's like in the independent scene, but we had a female professional wrestler on. That's on amazing. The podcast, yeah, that's amazing. Seven. Yeah, so like a lot of my mortgage and property management um, peeps, my franchisees and agents, and stuff, don't don't know that. But yeah, so I did. I did. Uh, that was the next thing. I always loved wrestling growing up, and I was like, well, why don't I just go for it? And uh, the reason for the long winded story, I think, is the moral that I try to, the moral of the story, which I, I try to talk about as much as possible to anyone that'll listen. That was the next big thing where I was like, I want to wrestle on television. I want the glitz and the glamour and everything else. And again, nobody was like, that's stupid, don't do it. So I just started doing it. And it turned out it was, and there, trust me, I was not the most talented guy. I could talk. I have the uncanny ability that if I don't like you, I have the uncanny ability if you let me talk to you, I can get you to a point to where you want to punch me in the mouth. Mm-hmm. I'm very antagonistic when I, when, I, when I want to be, and I, and I can be very condescending and everything else. Well, it turns out when you're a bad guy in wrestling and they give you a microphone and you have an a auditorium full of people, you can, you can tick a lot of people off really quickly, and that was my talent. So anyways, I started the independent scene and everything else, and it just kind of skyrocketed and... And the moral of the story was, turns out all the big dream stuff, it's actually easier than you think it is because that highway is really, really empty mm-hmm. because everyone else is too afraid to jump. Yes. And, and it's not even the fear of jumping. That's when I started to realize, wait a minute, all of my friends wanted to do what I was doing. I tried to bring a friend to wrestling class. Oh, my dad said he'll stop paying for my school if I do that because I need a nine to five job. You know, or somebody else would be like, oh, man, my parents would kill me. Or, oh, my, my, my grandma's going to help me out with a house or something. But she said, if I do that, I'm not going to do it because it's coming from a place of love and they just want you to be safe. Mm-hmm. But the problem with being safe is you have to stop dreaming. So what was interesting in mine was like it wasn't that I was like the ultimate dreamer. I just didn't have anyone in my life telling me not to. Okay. So my default setting was like, well, there's no reason not to. And it turns out it's really not that hard because – Turns out everyone else is too afraid or they're not allowed to try. Mm -hmm. So the odds are actually more in your favor than you'd expect. So when when I finally caught on to that at the wrestling part of things, then the sky was the limit. Anything that entered my head, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I wanted to, I wanted to raise, I wanted to climb the scale at the bank. Uh, By the time I was 25, uh, turning 26, I had the opportunity to become a branch manager at like 26 years old, running my own bank. And, um, that again went back to that sounded like a death sentence because all of a sudden it was like okay so 25 26 years old head down to what 60 you know collect the salary and have an amazing pension and but what terrified me was cool you're taking a human life which i've realized because of how i grew up how fragile that is and you're basically just sitting okay i'm just going to put that on repeat for 25 years that sounded awful Mm -hmm. so i left the bank I, I literally like it was one of it reminds me of a Steve Jobs quote, right? When it, if he woke up too many times, I can't remember the exact quote, ab living, obviously, but if he woke up too many times in a row, not excited to go to work, it was time for a change. And that was suddenly my like, di- that was my brick wall. I worked so hard to get that opportunity. It was put in front of me. And suddenly I was like, well, no, that's a death sentence. I don't want that. I ended up hopping out of the banking industry. I was a personal banker. One of my clients was like a high profile Canadian that was like, Hey, why don't you come work for my company? You can kind of travel the world selling my stuff. I thought, why not? Let's go try that. Long story short, that brought me to uh, another city. I had moved to a city for a girl so she can be closer to her family. We ended up breaking. Yeah. The, 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 that's a great idea. I was with this, this girl for like five years. I had oh, well, then survive. that makes sense. Okay, five years. Yeah, yeah. I five thought maybe years it was like time. a couple months. And no, you're just like, no, Okay, five no, years no, no, makes no. sense. Okay. I was seeing this girl for like five years through a lot of the winds and everything else. And uh, because I had no surviving family, her family would literally drive five hours one way twice a month to see us. Oh, wow. So she was like, look, could we move like kind of in between? Which turned, turned out was a little, little city called Brandon, Brandon Manitoba. Manitoba. Um, it's, it's, it's Manitoba's second largest city. And that's, that's not, not saying much. much. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like 50,000 50, people, um, on a, on a, on a good day, providing nobody's went shopping in Winnipeg type thing. So anyways, I moved there and, uh, we end up splitting up before I even have to move. 
I'm back in a rut again, hate the world, and uh, ended up rejoining the gym. By that point, I got fat. fat. I was out of shape. shape. I wasn't, wasn't taking care of myself. myself. Oh, also, did if you create the profile, was competitive bodybuilder, national ranked competitive bodybuilder. You can Doing get everything. The, you can see pictures on that where I was all, yeah, it was Juice Springsteen, um, which was just a whole other stupid adventure. But anyway, that but that was the, well, I want to do that. So I yeah. just did it. All that was behind me because, of course, you get com- five-year relationship. Mm-hmm. You're comfortable, right? So I'm out of shape, everything else. Decide to do this move for this girl. We break up. So I end up in Brandon, Manitoba, a place I had never been, much smaller than Winnipeg, suddenly all alone, driving in the U-Haul van, crying as I'm driving with my stuff type thing. So after a little bit of a pity party, I go back to my roots, and I join a local gym. And the front desk girl, when I walk down the stairs of the gym, is my wife. So uh, today, so I ended up meeting her and everything else. And um, through that, it all ties together. So through that, her and I went for our first mortgage and a real estate agent that I owe my entire career to suggested a mortgage broker. This was years ago now, because I'm you know getting on. There's a lot of gray here. Uh, suggested a mortgage broker to which me being one of the big five Canadian banks and ignorant because we were taught that mortgage brokers were bad said, no, 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 I have good credit. I don't need a mortgage broker. So very long story short, in the spirit of the podcast, um, ended up getting the mortgage to the mortgage broker. Halfway through it, the big company I had left the bank for to move was doing downsizing. Halfway through my mortgage application, they closed out my entire division and gave me a one-year severance check. Oh, man. So I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. So I called the mortgage broker and said, hey, really bad news. I've done lending all my life. I know how this is going to work. The bank you put me with is going to call and verify my employment. And they're going to say he doesn't have a job anymore. So I'm really sorry. Can I write you a check or something? Because you really changed my perspective of mortgage brokers. So if anything, this was a great learning experience. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry this isn't going to go through. And he gets really quiet. And he goes, what if I told you the bank verified all your conditions a couple days ago? I'm like, so what are you saying? He's like, well, if you want the place, it's yours. I'm like, well, I need a place to live. So yeah. And then this is the line. He's like, listen, when you sat down with me, you told me everything you needed in a mortgage. Like, you know, financing inside. No, why don't you become a mortgage broker? I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm a bigger city guy in a farming community. I've never lived in before. I have no sphere of influence. I have no networking. He's like, you have a year severance and it's a fully commissioned job. What have you got to lose? And the rest, the cliche line is the rest is history. So became a mortgage broker. Uh, within the first year, I was his top producing agent. Six months later, I was out producing his entire brokerage combined. Um, and then coincidentally, uh, across the street was a Centum mortgage brokerage where they had been trying to recruit me as a talent, uh, which I kept politely declining. And then the opportunity, the owner of that brokerage owned the Century 21 office uh, that it was in. And he took me for lunch one day and said, look, I have an opportunity that I think is going to change your life. Um, you know, the gals that work for this Centum, they're 60 plus. Um, they're not going to buy it. And we're thinking about selling it. Do you want it? So I ended up buying my own franchise, went from being an agent to being my own broker owner. We had like three people. Within a year, we had six. Um, long story short, when I left the position to take on, to become the president and CEO of the Centum network, uh, we had three offices across Manitoba. We were 20 plus agents and we were funding a hundred million dollars worth of mortgages in a small farming community. So it was, um, it was a heck of a ride. That's insane. That yeah. is, okay, wait, how old are you right now? I'm 38. So when I became so the president, you yeah, already the- have a biography. You already have a book. Like everything you just said, that's, that's just a book right there. That's, that's like the book that somebody writes at the end of their life, you know, like, hey, this is how I became successful. You already have every page of that book, writ- like essentially written right there. That's crazy. Lots it's of fun. jumps, for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm jumping a like, lot of stuff. And yeah, but it's, That's crazy. Uh, so did you think that that helped you or do you think that was just part of the chaos? Which part? Just jump, like pro like wrestling man so yeah so you know what it was it was um it wasn't so much the jumping that helped it, it was, was the, the it was the like taking the chains off a of pit bull you know mm-hmm. what i mean like that the 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 no loving family member having, having their, their love keep, keep you complacent, complacent. And, uh, and and yeah like all the all the traditional restrictions were off me there was no, there, so anything, anything I dreamt of, I just did. 
And and the more the more I realized that those restrictions were my the lack of those restrictions was my superpower, I just didn't hesitate. Every single time an opportunity landed on my on my plate, like the mortgage brokering thing, when he was like, Well, do you want to become a mortgage broker? You know, I asked him, like, how much money can you make? And I started understanding the economics. And then I just allowed myself to dream. I was like, well, wait mm-hmm. a minute. If I could do 100 deals, like, I could have any time, type of life I want. And where the average person would say, but that's not realistic. You know, maybe you should, you'll should. you probably only do 20 deals. Remember, b- because of everything that happened in the past, it was like, I can wrestle on television. I could do whatever the heck I want in this environment. Um, and I did. You know, and so so I think I think my biggest superpower was not having any caring voice over my shoulder telling me you can't i realized very very quickly there's no such thing as can't and 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 for anyone watching this please don't take this wrong just some people are wired this way right and i was just wired this way when i was staring in the mirror deciding whether or not i was going to continue or not locking a nine to five in for 30 years felt the same way that 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 felt like the same conclusion. Whether I ended my life there or locked in a nine to five for thirty years, it felt like dying. Mm-hmm. So I knew right away it wasn't for me. It, yeah. it couldn't be for me. I wasn't designed that way. And I and I realized that with mortgage brokering right away. Like my wife, I'm surprised we I'm surprised we were even married. Uh, we stayed married through the first couple of years. Like I would start cold calling at like seven a.m. And while we were watching television at 10 o'clock at night, I'm still shooting emails, trying to round up business from real estate agents. It just, it became an obsession yeah. because it, 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 cause it all resonated from what happened before where it was like, wait a minute, there's no limits in life. The harder I push, the higher I climb. It's that simple, mm-hmm. you know? So I didn't have, everyone's always like, well, how are you like, how do you have this like relentless amount of motivation? It's, I don't think of it as motivation. I just, I don't know. I just had this understanding of, wait a minute. So if I just always push, I will always grow and I will always succeed. So the way I'm wired, going back to that black and white thing, I'm like, so why wouldn't I always want to keep pushing? Mm -hmm. Because that translates, you know, yeah, it's weird. Some people like they want to push, but they don't have the motivation behind it. Yeah. And I think my superpower for the, for the motivation was it was all on me. If Mm -hmm. I didn't push, it was game over. I had no choice. Yeah. I had a, I had, a, I had a, a metaphorical gun to my head, literally, that I was either going to use to off myself or it was, listen, it's all on you. There's no excuses. If you phone it in, you'll, you'll, you'll be nothing. Mm-hmm. And that was my, uh, it, it was like an ingrained fear, you know, it's, uh, and I'm seeing it now. Like it's, you know, God forbid, unfortunately things happen, but like I've, I'm, you know, 38, I'm almost 40. I unfortunately have friends where parents are passing and stuff like that. And because I'm their finance guy, you know, that exact fear that I wasn't going to have, I'm now seeing with my friends, you know, I've got friends calling and they're like, Hey, you know, lost my dad. Yeah, man, I'm really sorry about that. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, no, no, I'm sitting on 600 K now and I don't know what to do with it. And it was that realization that at 40 or 50 or 55 or whenever that was never going to happen for me. Yeah. That was the driving force. Um, so now more than ever, it's kind of it's kind of neat to be at this age now because I'm seeing it again, and now that I have kids, it's an interesting dynamic because it kind of settled for a little bit. I didn't think about that like generational wealth or anything, um, but now that I'm seeing it, unfortunately, friends are now starting to to experience that, and now I'm looking. I've got a two and a half year old, and I've got a four month old, mm-hmm. and it's like fueled a whole new fire because I'm like, uh oh. I'm still building their nest egg. Yeah. Let's go. Giddy up. Let's go. You know, like, and like the harder I push now, they can have any life they want and any life they want being like, if they want to, I don't know if they want to, they want to sit there and like paint all day. Right. Like it just, my biggest thing now is like, how do I provide a life? How do I provide a life that allows them to have choice? Because Mm -hmm. I had choice because of a really messed up reason. What can I do now as a parent? Um, to make sure that they have any choice they want. At the same time, not turning them into some trust fund baby that everyone wants to I was to just going to say, throat. I'm like, yeah. wait. <laughs> and that's the bat. Well, that's just it. That's the balance, right? Like, and, yeah. and, and that's a new journey for me, which I'm going to cover. I've already started covering through social media, right? It's like, well, wait a minute. I don't want them to lose my grit. But at the same time, I also want to make sure they don't miss out on any opportunity because of x because unfortunately yes money doesn't buy happiness but sometimes it gets you to the right show right so it's like 
it's like what is that balance and uh that that's my next fun adventure that i've been playing through the personal content yeah that's that's crazy that's a crazy one is when it comes to your children especially because of your circumstance because of the way you were brought up but then it's like yeah how do you pass that along to your kids without essentially i don't know making them not useless but yeah sort of like they're yeah, doing totally. yeah, yeah they're doing whatever and then you're kind of just like feeding them money the whole time and you're like what are you gonna yeah. do right but yeah. i think it's a more like let them do what they love find their passion and push that passion whatever it may be you know yeah and, totally and, 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 and it's what we expose them to as well it's what we expose them to as well right like it, are they gonna have every new flashy toy no you know, like uh, Piper's almost three now. She's the only almost three-year-old I know that has never touched an iPad. And she's not going to. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, we're trying to be mindful of, like, wait a minute. Just because we have success, we don't have to make our kids dicks by reminding them that we have success. So they then echo that out to the world, right? Like, we all remember a kid in school that was like, we get it. You're the rich kid. You know, you mm-hmm. have the nice... Uh, I don't know if this was a thing in Vancouver, so you might have no point, but like, yes, you have the new starter jacket, right? The Georgetown Hoyas and the Chicago Bulls starter jacket on the yeah. playground and stuff like that was my generation anyways. Yeah. Uh, how do we make sure we don't breed someone like that, right? Like you can have success and, and uh, through, through wealth and, and not shout it from the rooftops, right? Like um, I've had a certain, I, I've had a, I, I'm very grateful for the amount of success I've had so far. I'm a t-shirt guy. Like Brendan and I have shot uh, content about this before. Like if you look at my closet, it's Costco black t-shirts. Like that's my, so it's yeah. like, how do we, how do we make sure that we hand that kind of mindset down to our, down to our kids? That's the kids are the ultimate perspective uh, bat, right? Like if you ever want to think about like, why am I doing the things I'm doing and realizing that everything you decide to do has a certain impact, man, have a kid. It just, it's no, for a loop. Don't tell me that. I don't want to have it. I have a dog. It's awesome. Yeah. I could leave him alone at a very young age and he's all good. But uh, I don't think I can do children. It's just like, here's the thing, Chris. And maybe like you could put me in a right place with this. I feel like if I have kids, I would never have time to do the things that I want to do. Like the podcast, this would be time spent taking care of a child, right? Like, yeah. There are all these things and all these aspects in my life that, yeah, I do want to do. And when people say, oh, you, you have kids, oh, kids change your life. Well, you know what else changes your life? Not having kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know? so here, so here's here's the counter offer. Um, yeah. Here's the counter offer. So you might not be able to do a podcast. Mm-hmm. There's days I'll do three of these. Yeah. I have, I have two kids. Yeah, you you always learn to get it done. Like now, okay. Chris Chris watching a baby being handed to his uh, to him like two and a half, almost three years ago, would have never believed that. Okay. I always tell everyone if I if I knew how to maximize my time like I do today because of children, if I knew that back then, I'd be the freaking prime minister by now. Yeah, like just like like the amount like you just learn to maximize every moment, and you and and, and the. the yeah. um, you, you realize, realize how much you dick around, around when, when you don't have kids. kids. You, you know, know like, like my schedule, schedule now is, is everything's going to end on time and I'm right into the next thing. And like, it could still all be done. What it comes down to, I think, is the fire. If you don't have the fire, yeah, you'll use kids as, as, a, as an out. Okay. Well, I can't. I don't have kids. Or I, yeah. I have kids. Now I'm too busy yeah. to do that. Where really, maybe you didn't have it in you in the first place to, to, uh, to do it, right? Um, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't worry about it, um, but I hear you on the not having kids. I, I didn't, I didn't want kids. Uh, mm-hmm. We actually only took the job in Vancouver. Go back to the whole bodybuilding thing. So my wife and I tried to have children for six years and couldn't. Okay. Spent spent thousands of dollars on IVF and hormone therapies and everything else. I only took the job in Vancouver because we were told by medical professionals we could never have children. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. At our going away party that our friends threw for us, you know, good old Captain Alcohol got in there for both of us. And more importantly, and this is a whole other topic, no, people don't appreciate the power that stress has on your body. Mm-hmm. 
So the minute we let it go, we were like, perfect. We, we had, we had, we had to do a lot of soul searching. We're like, okay, everything we know, our friends, our loved ones, everything we're, we're going to leave them because whatever you believe in, clearly our path is not to have children. Mm -hmm. Every weekend was another pool party with another set of my friends, kids and everything else. And we knew that wasn't for us. So we were like, well, I guess this is a sign. Let's move. The minute we let go of that stress, sold my business, sold our real estate, everything. We were at that going away party, knowing that we gave up on that life and it's time for a new one. All the stress released and we conceived at our own little after party when we traced it back. That's pretty <laughs> so, awesome. So you relate back to stress then. 100%. It was yeah. the expectation of like, be between the fact of like, when you've been struggling with infertility, every single time you could potentially, you know, you're thinking about it every day. Well, mm -hmm. I wonder if this treatment's going to work. I wonder if this is going to work. And that stress just eats you alive, right? So the minute we got to a point to where we were like, well, it doesn't matter anymore. It's never going to happen. And we're finally okay with that. We are finally actually okay with the fact the kids are never going to be there. And you let that burden lift, your, your body knows what it's doing. If you'll only allow it to, right? And, and yes, yeah. for some people, they have real, real infertility. And got a medical report to prove it that i had real infertility and um trust me first step was like is this little bugger mine um little bugger's mine <laughs> <laughs> jokes aside when my wife sees this she's gonna be like really did you make the did you make the uh did you make that joke but no it's it's crazy what stress does and going back to the whole kids thing you learn to evolve every parent that's watching this i can guarantee is nodding um you just turn into this you, you morph into someone you didn't think you could be. So with parents who use the excuse of their children getting in their way of them doing something they love and you saying that you can do it, you know, you just have to find the right way. What's like one piece of advice you would give somebody that's a parent that maybe has something that they want to do that they use their children as that excuse or have? And they're listening. They know who they are. Yeah. So, so it's, it, it's one of, this is where the black and white therapy comes in. And maybe that's something I, I coin, but like the black and white therapy is you either want it or you don't. And it's that mm -hmm. simple. And, and, and you're going to find a way or you're going to find an excuse. And that is really what it comes down to is um, you always have, like, I don't know if you've ever done a time audit exercise with yourself. Because you have to be really, you have to be really real, and you have to be really honest with yourself, and you got to okay. do it in that dark little room where there's no one around. But you actually do it a few days in a row, and you got to be honest and track your day. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like got up, laid in bed, laid in bed for 21 minutes, and surfed the gram. Yeah, R write write that down. Graphic content warning here, but like. What went poop, but sat there for 35 minutes because I'm screwing around on my phone. Write that down, you know, what I mean? and, and do that for a couple days. Like went for lunch, but then walked an extra 10 minutes because, you know, X. Do that for a couple days and then add up the waste at the end of okay. every day. And I've, I've taken mortgage brokers and property managers through that. Like go through that exercise. But the problem is you've got to be willing to be honest with yourself. And even if you have kids, you, if you're honest, you look at that number at the end, people just... They, it generally ends the same way. They look and they're like, yeah, okay, I'll shut up now. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all have, it just, it depends what we make a priority, priority right? right? You, you know, know how many people tell me they, they don't have time, but, but then they'll bring me up to speed on this show or that show? Yeah. To me, not having time equates to the same as uh, being tired. Like being too yeah. tired, yeah. you know? Because like, you have the time to watch the show, right? But you don't have the time to do this thing that might take a little more work. Yeah. So I have like the 15 minute rule that I implement to things. If I get, because okay. sometimes I get into a rut, like um, maybe I have to edit a podcast episode and I put it off one day. I put it off the next day. I put off, you know, I, I just keep putting it off for a few days. So I'm like, oh, I really got to edit this episode. So I have this sort of 15 minute rule. I'm like, Okay, I have to sit down every day and you could do this whether you're learning to play the guitar or whatever, right? Um, we're going to use the podcast for an example. I have to edit the podcast. I'm going to sit down 15 minutes a day. That's it. I can do 15 minutes a day, whatever. But what you'll notice is if you do the 15 minutes, you actually end up doing more. 
you yeah. go for 30 minutes or an hour. Next yeah. thing you know, like you finished it that day. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I find the 15 minute rule, like I apply that when I'm lazy to do something. I'm like, oh, I'll just do it for 15 it. minutes. Because if I'm still lazy 15 minutes later, I'll stop. I did my 15 yeah. minutes, right? Yeah. But and it's not eating you up so much. Yeah, but nine times out of 10, I do it for much longer than 15 minutes. I just yeah. get into it. So a buddy of mine was, uh, he plays the guitar. He hadn't played for a long time. I told him that. And a week later, he called, he's like, dude, I've been playing the guitar every day because I've been doing that I whole 15 it. minute thing. Yeah. So that's like my little uh, pitches do the 15 minute rule. I, I complete to validate what he's saying. I completely agree. So I've been doing it with fitness at home where it's yeah. like, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. So if it enters my head, oh, crap, I should work out today. But if it seems stupid, wherever I am in the house, I drop and start doing push ups. Yeah. I'll I've literally just drop. Too. My yeah. kid thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> like, oh, look what daddy's doing, right? I'll start doing push ups. But by the t- to your point, by the time you get to the end of that first set, the endorphins are starting to do their job. Definitely. You know what I mean? You start to feel good. And I'm like, okay, cool. Now I'm going to do some squats. And like, it might only be 15, 20 minutes that I get the heart, but at least I get it going. But it all starts from the just, just, just shut up and start. Yeah. And, 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 and it'll take care of itself. To, to just cap the whole parent thing, I, I just want to make one comment, which I think is not talked about enough. Mm-hmm. And it's a very, very liberating thing that is hard to do. So if you're beating yourself up, and you're using kids as an excuse or something like that because like, oh, I want I want to launch a podcast, but oh, I have kids or, oh, I would work out, but, you know, I don't have. Be okay with the fact that maybe you're just not meant to do it. Yeah. Accept that because beating yourself up day in and day out that you don't get it done, maybe examine the fact that you're just not meant to do it. And that's okay. You're It's only a failure because you're trying to force yourself to do it. The minute mm-hmm. you let it go, like, okay, so me with guitar. If I tried guitar for three days, guess what? By the third day, I'm listing that thing on Facebook Marketplace. And I'm mm-hmm. not going to lose any sleep on it. I'm not meant to play guitar. Don't have any, like, just because it sounds sexy or it sounds alluring or something like that, I'm not, you're not meant to do it. Clearly, you're not meant to do it. And I, like, so for the parents watching or anyone trying to start something and they just can't get it done, think about the fact that maybe you're just not meant to do it. And that's perfectly all right. You are the only one putting that expectation and pressure on yourself. Because here's the thing. If I really want to do something, like it's always in the back of my head, oh, I I really want to start this podcast or I really want to be a broker or whatever it may be. And then like, I don't do it because of the lack of time or because I have these excuses, whatever it may be, kids or work or whatever. Um, Is that a reason not to try it? Because in my opinion, it's like, if you try and fail, then yeah, maybe you weren't meant to do it. But if you don't try, then you don't even know. You won't know, right? Yeah. So you got to get to the try. You got to attempt. You have to at least attempt and fail. See, I guess, I guess my question, I guess my question to anyone with, with, with that kind of position is, if you really want it so bad, why can't you even get to the point of trying? Mm-hmm. I, and that's, that's the question I pose to people is, yeah. If you really want it that bad, you do um, it. You do it. Yeah. I'd love to be a, I'd love to be an actor in the movies. That sounds cool. The fame, the the fame, the prestige, the parties, everything else. Yeah. But I'm never going to do, do it. it. You, you know, know like like cuz I I, I, mean, I just I, I, I know I'm not going to put in the work. I know I'm not going to make it a priority. I, like I know I've got a face like this. You know, like this is uh, you know, this is the beard is there because if I took off my glasses, I'm essentially a thumb with a face, right? So like, <laughs> but, but where I'm going with that is like that, that, yes, there is things I would really love to do. Yeah. But then you just kind of be honest with yourself, right? I think that's what it is. It's like, you can want to do something, but just be honest with yourself. If you've been telling yourself you want to try it for two years and you can't bring yourself to do it, mm-hmm. maybe you're, maybe you're romantic about the idea, but maybe you genuinely don't want to do it. At flip side of that, think about the things you do do. And why do you think you do them? Because you're, it's probably more in tune with who you are. And, that, and we could go down the rabbit hole of like social media and everything else. But like, I get literally dozens of DMs from kids every day. And they're like, entrepreneur, 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 entrepreneur. It's the buzzword. Yeah, I was going to bring but, this up. But, but then their follow-up question is, so what should I do? What should my business be? You're romantic with the idea. You genuinely don't want it. 
Yeah. And that's perfectly okay. But unfortunately, social media now is putting on these kids, well, if you're not an entrepreneur and work for yourself, you're a loser. You know, if you have to force yourself to try and do it and you've been wearing it for years, maybe it, maybe you're not meant to do it. And that's perfectly fine. Because if you try to put something else in its place and suddenly you start doing it, well, it kind of validates the argument, right? Mm -hmm. one, of, uh, one of the things that I did want to talk to you about mm -hmm. is that whole like... Uh, entrepreneurial and you know talking about personal brands and stuff like that right because we know you have your own personal brand too and in a sense you know even you could say i'm going down that road or whatever but i yeah. found that after gary v you know good buddy of yours i guess uh came out and started just plowing out all of these awesome inspirational tidbits videos clips instagram posts whatever right we see a lot of that but I see a lot of that in people that, like for you, it would make sense for me to look at somebody like you with those kinds of content and video or Gary, it makes sense because you guys are on a certain level. You guys have been there, done that. You guys have built yourselves up. So therefore have a repertoire and thus, you know, it's somebody you could technically look up to or gain insight from. But I see Instagram accounts and people posting like they are a Gary V or a Ty Lopez. I hate Ty Lopez, but I'll use him. I don't hate him, hate him. I just don't really like his method of approach, right? You know, um, his agenda is selling stuff first and foremost, yes, let's be honest. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's not providing value. It's providing like 10 seconds of, hey, this is what I could do for you. Blah, blah, blah. All you got to do is buy my book. Click the link below. I hate that crap. Uh, Gary V, I kind of fell in love with early on because he provided the content and value and inspiration. Yeah. And then, you know, he gets the kickback after the fact kind of thing, right? Um, and with you, it, it's much similar. But you see like these 20-year-old young gun kids who are suddenly like photo and inspirational quote. And then it's like, oh, dude, you're still not done college. You haven't done anything. Yeah, yeah what, what, what am I doing? Or you're selling miracle water you know, like King and water, some, you know, like what, <laughs> whatever, like you, you got some, some like uh pyramid scheme going on and that's your thing. Even like you can go down Grant Cardone, but once again, seller. Oh, right? I, was like, like, I was like, I was like, I was like, oh, please don't do that. Please, yeah. please don't yeah. do Huge that. Sell. So, and this is where it diverts because once yeah. again, there's people like yourself or like Gary V or certain people that provide content and value first, but then there are people I, I put Simon, I put value. Simon Sinek, I put Simon Sinek on the, uh, on the Gary V side. So yeah. Something like Simon. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, people that provide true content and have been there, done that, those people mean a lot to me. But I, when I see a video of some guy who's in front of a mansion washing two Lamborghinis that he probably rented for the day. And he's like, this is how you get, ah, oh, just get out of here. Like, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I just, I'm done with that, that uh, faux entrepreneurial, uh, like fake Gary V content. Like, just get it out yeah. of here. And, and yeah. you know, like, let, let the pros do their thing. Well, and um, here's the, here's the ironic part. It's, and, and thank you for, Anytime I can be glumped in a bucket with Gary Vee's name, I'm like, hey, but I, I certainly don't consider myself that way. But there is a pattern. Um, comb both our pages. You don't see material stuff at all. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's not it's not who we because it's not about that. Totally. It's, it's just like it is genuinely not the agenda. You know, the agenda is how do how do I wow as many people as possible? Because that's genuinely a currency like that. That's. I try to use the, he uses the word auction. I try to use the word currency, but it's not, you know, obviously not, not real monetary, but like that's my currency is the feedback I get through DM and everything else to kind of, um, to kind of expand on your, on your point. This is what gets me. And this is, I'd like to make this point. If I could, I get so many young, I just started my motivational page, blah, blah, blah. And entrepreneur, exactly what you're saying. I just yeah, started it. All. I just like... started it. I just started it all now. Um, uh, could you help me with a business idea? What should I do? And the thing I always, the thing I always tell everyone is, do you think, do you think Gary went and asked somebody what he should do? Do you exactly. think, do you think, do you think I went and bugged someone and said, Hey, give me a purpose. Give me something to, like the point is, is like, if you've got to ask someone else what you should be doing, maybe entrepreneur isn't in your vocabulary mm -hmm. yet, yet caveat yet. Like, 
the entrepreneurial spirit and now in trying to and because it's such a buzzword i hate even talking about it but for those of us that do it it's a real thing the entrepreneurial spirit is my entrepreneurial spirit was at a very very young age nine to five felt like i was dying that was not a life i want like that was might as well kill myself and that's how i was wired that doesn't mean it like the majority of people are okay with that but that's, but that's the, the true entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, spirit where you're like no no, no. Like life never changing for 20, 25 years. I can't build, I can't provide value to others. I can't bring people up with me because of my ideas. And like, no, I have no desire for that. It was a visceral reaction to, to create, you know, mm-hmm. and that's either there or it's not. And, and the problem with social media, with the, we live, we live in an era of social validation, right? Turns out if we all got you in the room and there was somehow able to have like a, a truth button over top, none of you are entrepreneurs. <laughs> you, you know, like it's... Uh, the other it's, thing it's with so entrepreneurs sad. is like, you all do more than one thing and have. You've always bounced around. Even Gary V, you know, Wine Store, Wine Library TV, YouTube, you know, Vanier Media. There's just so much, you know, encompassing because the him. wheel never stops. Even you, right? Same thing. Pro wrestler to mortgages, you know, like it just, you guys did more than one thing. And to me, that's what encompasses like an entrepreneur is like, it's not that you're doing one thing right and you're doing it yourself. It's that you are able to do many things and you've done many things. And that's where the entrepreneur part of the term comes in. You know, that's the miss. That's what, that's what I think a lot of people don't realize is I can't shut it off. I really can't. Like there's like like we're doing mortgages and we're doing real property management and everything, but like, trust me, there's other things on the horizon. And yeah. there will be far more things. And it's not because it's like, oh, like I'm just able to get things done. I have no other choice. I can't shut this off. Mm-hmm. And, and true entrepreneurs can't. Like you might lay on a beach and think about like, I can't wait to plan my next vacation. I can't lay on a beach because I start getting too many ideas. Yeah, that's exactly you know, what it, it is. It's the ideas of what am I going to do next? What do yeah. I want to do next? Oh, I wanted to do this for a while. I'm going to go do it now. Yeah. yeah. Or, or even how do I make this better? You know, that that's mm-hmm. what sent, Centum has been. Because ob- like, obviously I started from the mortgage broker background. Centum to me is like, it's a romance. It's a romance that is just getting stronger every day where it's like, okay, we did this. Now, how can we do this? How can we, ex- how can we enhance the experience of every mortgage broker that's under our banner? And that's endless. If you, if you come to work every day with that attitude and then you have an amazing team behind you, that never ends. Like if you're, gen- if you're genuine about delivering value, it's an infinite mission. And that's what I love about it. You'll never ever get to the point to where you're like, we have given them everything. Mm-hmm. Because the landscape, here, we're going to volley up a perfect segue for you, by the way, because the, because the landscape uh, changes, right? And because the landscape is forever changing, you never get bored if you're genuinely trying to deliver value to the people in your organization. Speaking of changing landscapes, <laughs> are we getting to Corona now? Is that what we're talking about? Wherever you, wherever you, I, I thought we could, we could, we could go there yeah. if you want. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to know, because obviously Corona virus has affected everybody's business. It yeah. affected me. It even affected the podcast and everything that I do. Um, but you dealing with mortgages, real estate, it's definitely affecting you guys. Yeah. So what's the deal? when it comes to mortgages now, what do you foresee happening in the near future? And what is maybe uh, Centum doing as far as all this COVID-19 goes? Like are mortgages being put on hold? Like, is it going to be harder to get a mortgage down the road? Right. What are we looking at? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can take this a couple of different directions. So first and foremost, I think the thing that a lot of people don't realize is everything is still open for business. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, not in the literal sense, but like, you know, you call any realtor, they're still more than willing to get you into a house. It's just the game has changed. Mortgage brokers, of course, they're still there to do your mortgage, but the game has dramatically changed. The the housing market, the real estate market as a whole, yeah, it's down. It's down well over, you know, we're, we're north of 70% kind of thing, but it is rebounding very, very quickly. Um, I myself, um, possession day is today on a house that I bought on Sunday. Okay. You know, like it, like it, it is definitely happening. Mm-hmm. 
so there's been a lot of bad in the sense of like, yeah, if you're owning a home right now, um, you probably don't want to be selling unless you absolutely have to. Now, the other side of that coin is unfortunately, if one of you or both of you in the household have lost your jobs, yeah, you're probably having to sell, right? And that, that's a very, that's a very real landscape. Uh, what, what's been very, um, interesting so far is everyone when everyone thinks there's a decline or there's doom and gloom everyone thinks like oh no houses are going to be worthless and this and that and the other thing so i'll give you a general overview property values have really not dipped a whole lot let's use vancouver as a prime example because <clears throat> people are like why haven't they dipped in vancouver i want to buy a house well they have dipped a, a moderate amount, uh, amount but here's why let's pick something on the on the uh, you know the mainland of vancouver Things have been changed because, yeah, instead of 20 offers, now there's four good ones. Mm -hmm. And now it's the now it's the um, it's the entry level Amazon employees. They're like, holy crap, I've been writing offers on houses for a year and a half now. And I'm usually like the 18th offer in and it turns out I'm offer number two and I'm actually being seriously considered now. So in the major centers, it's giving it's giving the people that have been trying for a long time an opportunity. Right? Their offers are now competitive. So that's really, really good to see. The smaller center, so back in Brandon, Manitoba, for example, where I'm from originally, it's like, dare I say, like volume-wise, like amount of mortgages we're processing and everything else, it's borderline business as usual and has been the whole time. I had a okay. meeting with that. I had a, I had a meeting with them last week. Uh, mortgage volume, they've done more mortgage volume this year, like actual like amounts of mortgages just combined. If you add up yeah. all the mortgages, they did the total volume of mortgages, but, but they're, they're down a handful of units. So they've done a couple less units. They've done a little bit more uh, volume. As far as like what what's came out of it, it's like the landscape has changed. I'm of the personal opinion because you're starting to see how I'm wired for the better. We're not doing face-to-face -face meetings anymore. Mm -hmm. but sometimes those, those can be long, you know, those can be really long. You get distracted, everything else, you have to go to a location, you have your commutes, everything else. Well, now we're doing, now we're doing virtual mortgage signings and we're doing, and we're doing zoom commitment signings. Okay. As, as you've probably seen, like small talk doesn't happen nearly as often on zoom kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. and doc and DocuSign makes it really easy. Click, 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 click. Holy crap. I signed a mortgage document where traditionally that would be 45 minutes of sign here. Now we're going to talk about this side here. So there's been a lot of um, efficiencies in the real estate game and in the mortgage broker game that have come out of the result of this, right? So people being able to scale their business. Well, if you're expecting people to commute, you yourself have to commute and everything else, the average mortgage, the average busy mortgage broker, that might only be six appointments in a day. Well, now that we've been doing it long enough, the high producing mortgage brokers are like, I can fit 10 appointments in. Yeah. This is a game changer, right? So, because they're evolving through this. What's What's also interesting is some of our some of our brokerages. There's one down uh, downtown Toronto, like just off Bay Street. So, like some of the most expensive financial real estate in the financial sector, real estate out there. You know, he would he would hold uh, team meetings where he has forty people, and like on average, like seven would show up to the regular mm -hmm. team meetings. He'd bring in banks to educate the brokers on the new way and everything else. Well, a Zoom meeting, he's averaging 30 attendees. So yeah. now he's looking back and he's like, remind me why I'm paying $35,000 a month for my space? Why am I doing that? Mm -hmm. And he's a phenomenal marketer. So now he's yeah. starting to be like, wait a minute, if we had a virtual office, what could I do with an extra even $25,000 in ad revenue a month? Wait a minute, now I can suddenly start competing with the big banks in the world, right? So it's Definitely. there's been a lot of good come out of it. Like every industry, and I'm really curious to see, like obviously you, I'm sure you know other podcasters and everything else. I, I'm interested, interested to see the perspective, but those that those that don't lean into the changes, yeah, they're going to see this for what it is. They are going to see it as a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But for but for those people that leaned into the new world, I I truly believe they're going to thrive. And I felt bad saying that a month ago because you had to be sensitive to people's feelings, and people would be like, "What are you talking about? This is the worst thing ever." You know what? I'm I'm going out. I'm going on the record. Like, no, if you've leaned into every opportunity you've been given through this, yes, it's going to be hard, and you're not making the same paychecks and everything. But you're going to come out of this. I truly believe the average mortgage broker and property manager is going to come out of this better than they did before because you can scale your business more. You're able to sign more contracts and, and just conduct more business, sign more business a lot more efficiently. Um, 
and you're you're cutting out all the, the the commutes and everything else and i think that networking has gone up substantially as well do you think that the pandemic caused not like it didn't cause us to change the way we work but it caused an expert like it expedited the way we were gonna end up working do you know what i mean yeah well, like, do you yeah, think 100%. that this is how we were gonna go anyway like 10 years from now this is how we would have uh ended up working and everyone most people would work from home if they could or remotely or they're doing zoom conferences or your mortgage broker you're doing it through zoom or whatever uh, do you think like that was just an eventuality and that the pandemic kind of just sped up that process, like just made us go from like A to Z instead of jumping from A, B, C, D throughout like slow transition? Like I don't see Google, for example, or Facebook uh, closing down campuses or anything like that. But do you see them downscaling their office sizes for sure and trying to make most people work remotely from here on out? Yeah, so I think the, um, you know, your your first your first question is really interesting uh, because I think it depends which hat you were um, you were wearing, and it's exactly what you said. Like Facebook, Google, Apple, those guys put millions, bordering on billions, into their campuses and their workspaces, and everyone gets free food, and everyone gets a bed, and drive a scooter, and everything else. So I, I think before the pandemic hit, all these companies, it was like a badge of honor work here look how cool it is you know you all you all get your own segue kind of thing um where the employees i think very much were maybe a little bit different mindset i think it was like a space race who could have the absolute coolest work environment so the employees just want to live there and if we get them to live there and they love it it does things for culture but man their productivity if they're on campus 24 hours a day because they don't want to leave we should get more work out of them and we'll be able to say we're the coolest we'll attract the top talent in silicon valley because we'll be the funnest place to work the employees of course were like if you weren't digging that you were like i could do this from anywhere to your point i could do this from anywhere kind of mm -hmm. thing so i think there was two hats um what's interesting now is obviously facebook and google were the first to say yeah no one's coming back this year because I think that was the responsible thing to do. And, 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 and a lot of what they do, hence why they have the coolest workshops, they always want to be at the forefront of we, we treat employees best. Yeah. So, of course, they're going to have first movers advantage there to be like, oh, yeah, no, no, we care about our people. Don't come back. What's going to be interesting is that money is still spent. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. all that infrastructure is still there. I'm curious to see over the next 18 to 24 months, because these guys have more money than anyone, do they just wash their hands because they're like, well, it could be more of a sensitive issue. Try to bring people back. Mm -hmm. Do they find new creative ways to make it cool to be back in the office? It's going to be really, really interesting. So the big, the big know. guys, I'm not too sure, but well, that's just it. So like, cause it's I, already so cool to be there. <laughs> like, have you been yeah. to the Google campus? No. I'm not smart enough to be on the Google campus. No, no. So if you have a friend who works there, you can go there and uh, yeah. they'll show you around. So I had a friend who worked at Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, his buddies worked at Google. So we went right. down there and they all took us to all the different campuses. So LinkedIn guy took us to LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook guy took us to Facebook, whatever, right? So we end up at Google and uh, shout out to John who uh, showed us around. Dude. Like, they made me want to work there for free. I didn't even, I didn't <laughs> even want to point, leave. Though. They had yeah. these different cafeteria buildings. And, like, they didn't even look like cafeteria buildings. They looked like really sleek, awesome buildings, right? But they had multiple cafeterias all over campus. And all of them had different themes. And even within those themes, they had everything. You Like, you can go to one cafeteria. You could find pizza, sushi, whatever like any food you want thai food it's there it's ready to go then i'm looking there's this glass kitchen and there's like eight chefs like with their arms back watching this one chef like cook and he's explaining everything i'm like oh like you know like they're they're like cooking something new or what's going on there he's like oh no 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 that's a class that we can take it's a cooking class you can come here and our head chef here will teach you how to cook these different meals but otherwise, you have all these stations, like your sushi station, whatever, and there's a guy rolling sushis, you know, there's 
a dude making pizza all in-house. They have a smoker, a huge smoker, biggest smoker thing you've ever seen in the back of the complex where in the morning they just like roast pigs and everything. The wow. guy's like, when you wait, when you come here at 6 a.m., it just smells like barbecue. <laughs> right? Yeah. So they make it so you don't even want to leave. And they yeah. even, they're smart. They time dinner. So it's at seven. Most people leave at six. Yeah. And so it's a first... game catcher so that people stay longer on campus and work longer. Yeah. It's not crazy. So yeah, yeah. They, they make it so you don't want to leave. So that's why I'm also curious. Like, what do you do with these big buildings if they're no longer relevant i would say maybe a university takes it over right because it's campus like it's it's fit for that kind of uh structure but will schools even in the well i I was gonna say i wouldn't i wouldn't bet on universities because they've already found a new way in a new world right like it's um I, th- I I do think it'll come back. I think the big guys like the you know the uh, the Googles and and Facebook and everything. I think they will find a way to bring their people back. What's interesting is companies like ours, you know, and mm-hmm. our size kind of thing, where yeah, like we're we're seriously considering the amount we spend on real estate to be in Coal Harbor in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Where here's the ironic part: we're getting more productivity out of all our people than we ever did when they were in the office. Oh wow! So what are we? So what are we doing? You know, like, I don't know if you've ever looked into how much it costs to rent something in the financial district in Coal Harbor. It is. Yeah, it's not cheap. Head, it'll make your head spin. So, like, the entrepreneur, like me, is like, so wait a minute. If I didn't have $90,000 a month rent, what could I do with that? Mm-hmm. You know, what can I do? Like, a month. Think about that. Like, the economics of that. Like, I could double down the marketing. Holy crap, I could get that new tool I was thinking about that we could roll out for brokers, but I wasn't quite sure how to subsidize it and make it make sense. Like, it just opens up a whole new world. Now, that being said, I am not against offices. I, My team and I were talking about this. We all miss going for a drink after work and just venting. Yeah. Okay. You know, like, and and <laughs> laughing on a Zoom call versus laughing with people in person hits completely different as the kids say now that i'm getting uh now i'm getting a little bit older so i I, there's a place but i have no doubt in my mind that you're going to see downsizing and and that now to flip it back to real estate and that's going to get really fascinating because commercial real estate is about to go on sale like no one's business and i i spit when i say his name but grant cardone is talking about this a lot i cannot stand grant cardone Mm -hmm. he's talking about it a lot (laughs) you and me well, and so he's talking. Yeah. He's he's talking about it a lot. Where he's like, "Listen, commercial real estate is about to go on sale," and I'm like, "Yeah, that's true." But if nobody wants it, what does that matter? But what he's interestingly enough layering in is like, you're going to see so many office buildings convert to micro condos and condos that it's not even funny. And I'm like, "Now that is fascinating," and I can't believe I'm saying the word "right" in the same sentence as his name, mm-hmm. but. I think we're going to see that, especially in places like Vancouver. You well, know, Grant it's... Cardone also says something interesting. He says, don't buy a house. He says it's not a wise investment. He's like, why Why would you buy a house? So do you agree with that? Depends on your financial situation, right? Okay. So, so, and I'll actually use myself as an example because mm-hmm. – um, I, since I got to Vancouver, coming from Manitoba, I was doing, I was doing very well in Manitoba. I was almost mortgage free and everything was good. And I was 30 something and almost mortgage free in a two story house with a walkout basement on the river, half a block from the golf course. I'm like life pegged, but it was like $300,000 because Manitoba, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I move here and I'm like, holy crap, I can't buy a house. I got to buy a box. And then eventually flip it and the good news is like you get into the box in vancouver just wait three months and then it's worth substantially more than you uh bought it for and you could keep selling so we played that game for a bit and then i finally got to the point to where my money just didn't grow fast enough at the rate this is move number six and we haven't lived here four years yet wow just to put it in perspective of and we lived every i i've lived in richmond i've lived in new west and not the good new west on yeah. like queen there, Queensboro, there is no the good island. new west dude. okay thank you i didn't <laughs> want to say it but just somebody no, watching it there's no good new west but I, but no i lived on queensboro like on that little yeah. peninsula wow. which makes it useless to get it but it was it was the fastest year over year um from a value appreciation point okay the one year so what i did was like i'm like okay fine I'll, 
I'll live wherever I got to live, wherever I can get the fastest appreciation because I got to eventually get into a house and that's going to cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the minimum down payment. And then I got to figure out how I'm going to pay the $8,000 mortgage payment. And sadly, I'm not exaggerating. So up until last year, we sold our last condo and then we had the second baby on the way. And suddenly I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not ready for a house yet. Four bedroom Mm -hmm. house. I'm looking at a minimum down payment of the houses in North Vancouver that we were interested in. Minimum of a down payment of like 340. 340 grand. I got to have that in my checking account. You know, yeah. like, like that, I'm like, well, that's insane. So for the first time ever, we rented, and this is where this, this is, is going to answer your question. question. I have a visceral, visceal reaction to rent it because I'm like, well, wait a minute. At least, At least I'm paying, paying down, down my own mortgage, and I'm itself. somewhere where property's appreciating. Where yeah. rent, I'm just like, here, I'll pay your mortgage for you, right? Totally. Which I had a hard time with. Vancouver is very unique because I could rent this house for $4,300 a month, which is my rent. I'm very, I'm transparent to a fault. This is, I pay $4,300 a month to rent this, but to buy this house, this house, and it's modest at best. And hopefully the owner of the house is never watching this, but it's modest yeah. at best. It's the smallest house I've ever lived in, in, in my life. Okay. And, uh, but it's probably still worth two, two. Mm-hmm. I need 20% down to buy this thing. Do them. Yeah. That's the minimum down payment. So do the math. Yeah. You know, so 20%, I need 400 plus just to pull the trigger. And then the mortgage payment is still like $6,900 before property taxes. So that's, that's where crazy. for the first time in my life, I was, wait a minute. So if I part with a good portion of my net worth and then I can pat myself on the back for owning, it's still going to cost me three or $4,000 more a month. Wow. Owning no longer makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I rented. I was like, wait a minute, it's actually smarter, smarter for, for my money. money. The, the extra, extra three, four thousand dollars I'm saving plus the three hundred and forty thousand dollars I can keep in the stock market where yeah. I have an average rate of return, which by the way, call me out on it, I dare you. I've shown Brendan, my videographer, mm-hmm. uh, no joke. I've shown him screen shots. I average a forty three percent year over year return on my stocks. Nice. So keeping three forty in there every single year versus dumping it out into a house that now, especially because of what's going on, is probably losing value. For the first time ever in my life, it didn't make sense anymore. Mm-hmm. Now, I, but I just said, I just bought a house. I bought a house in Langley. Okay. Isn't Langley because, still expensive though? I hear prices there are quite... Not comparably though. Like, okay. like, 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 yes, it, by Manitoba standards, you're all nuts. Like, <laughs> like you know, Langley, like it just, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, like I said, two-story house on the river. Well, it didn't break four hundred thousand dollars. Like I don't even like I don't even understand how you can build it that cheap, like for that for that amount kind of thing. It just it, the pricing was astronomical, uh, or ridiculous. I mean, now looking at Langley, we were about to we we needed to sign a new lease. Well, because of COVID, all the property owners are really nervous right now. So all yeah. of them were like, "Look, we'll accept your application, but we'd really prefer you give anywhere from three months to six months in advance for a mm-hmm. deposit." Because we're, because right now, don't forget the laws for rent, I could technically move into the place right now, instantly defer my first rent payment, and there's nothing they could do about it. Because right now, you're not allowed to evict somebody in BC because of COVID. So because of that, they're like, wait a minute, we don't want squatters. We don't want to let somebody in, and they just put their rent on hold, and then we're stuck holding the bag. So I'm working out those numbers, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. So it's going to cost me damn near $40,000 to sign another year lease here in North Vancouver. Because the rent is, it's up there, right? Or I can go buy in Langley. I could buy a house for, uh, if you're buying a house for a million dollars or under, you only have to put 5% down on the first 500,000 then 10% down on the second 500,000. So just really, really quick math. You need $75,000 only if you buy a house for $999,999. So I'm looking at it, 40 $42,000 $42,000 for the one house I really liked that we were going to lease. $42,000 up front, $6,600 a month for a year. $75,000 on a house in Langley, 3,000 square foot house. It's only a couple years old, and it's got a two-bedroom legal suite that can make me money. And I put $75,000 down, and my mortgage payment's $4,100 a month. Nice. Suddenly, it makes more sense to own again. So, so in a very, very long-winded winded. way... Grant Grant says the stupidest thing you could do is buy a house. Yeah, because he's got so much money that he's he's using his passive income 
to borrow a place. So of mm -hmm. course, it's easy to say that when you've got millions upon millions. If you don't own a single property and you don't have investments and everything else, and you live in a place like Vancouver and you can get in, just ask yourself, what else could you be doing with your money that's going to help it grow as fast as owning real estate in Vancouver? But I'll it has you, to make sense. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing I dislike doing, and that is leaving my money in the bank. Yeah. So I will, so I will ask you, because I, I talk to people about this all the time. Like, I tell everyone, I'm like, don't leave your money in the bank. Like, either put it into stocks, put it into investment, or like I'm very big on cryptocurrency. I'm a huge proponent uh, and fan of Bitcoin and all that jazz. Not necessarily just to uh, invest and make money off of, but also I do believe that it will be like a global currency in the future. I don't know if you have a thought on that or not. Um, do you invest in, in crypto at all? So I did. Um, and then you lost money and you got mad and you stopped? No, quite, okay. quite, the, quite the opposite. So... Um, Again, in the spirit of being like transparent to a fault, I don't see any value in it whatsoever. Like actual okay. fu functional value, like like practical mm -hmm. value in it. And yes, I get it. It's there's way definitely move practical around. value. In it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you're creative and you want to move, like for me, it's like if I want to move money around and I want to avoid the government, I'm going to use mm -hmm. some crypto. Like that's yeah. that's cool. Um, I trust me. I see a lot of practical purposes, yeah. just not for just not for me. Yeah. But hey. You're a drug cartel or you're selling weapons. No, okay, your... look. Everybody, <laughs> that's the number one thing everybody says. It's like, you know, all the casinos in Vancouver have nothing but money laundering and fraud. You know, there's more yeah. fraud in real estate. So the market that you work yeah. in, Chris, has yeah, more yeah, fraud yeah. in it than the I, cryptocurrency I, I, market. I'm just saying, ignorant perspective of mine, yeah. I, don't have a, I don't have a functionality for it. I'm not buying things I overseas. I, you know, like, yeah. I, um, I don't buy enough overseas where I want to deal with exchange rates and stuff like that. Totally. Like, and not only that, the volatility scares me. Yeah. Right? The, 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 and that's, that's kind of the main thing. Like, mm -hmm. I can't buy a house off you for a million dollars worth of Bitcoin because mm -hmm. by the time we close, it might be worth half that. Which or means you're worth double that. or or, or yeah. might be worth double. So either you're getting screwed and I'm get and or I'm getting screwed. Until that volatility is gone, it will never hit mainstream. And the volatility won't be gone until uh, Bitcoin until it's peaks. accepted. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, until, like, it peaks, until it peaks or until yeah. it's accepted as well, right? Like like yeah. it's um, so. What did I do with the crypto thing? So yeah, my my crypto story. Where, when you'll know this is far better than I. Was it two years ago or three years ago? Probably two thousand seventeen. Leading when... up to leading up to Christmas, where everyone found out about crypto at the masses, kind of thing. Yeah, I turned nine hundred dollars into forty seven thousand dollars between mm -hmm. like November something to the first week of January. Cashed yeah. out and said, "Cool, this is awesome." I I'm turned nine hundred dollars into forty seven grand. I never need to go back, and I've never. I, Occasionally, I check my, um, I don't even know what it's called anymore, CoinSquare wallet. I'll go in and look. I've got a little bit of Ethereum and I've got a little bit of Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I, I do still have it on my Google notifications if, if Bitcoin drops because I'm kind of tempted to put it in there yeah. um, if, it, if it drops again. So, like, I, I don't know. I, I, it was a means to an end for me, not mm -hmm. from its practical sense, but it was like, hey, cool, because nobody really understands it and it's a fad. I can make some real money here. Off yeah. of, off of, well, I hate to say, it, I can make money off stupid people. You yeah, know, like, it, it, like really, that that that's what. It, so that's what it's been for me. Um, mm -hmm. That's what crypto's been. I can't remember the second half of the question there. Sorry about that. We kind of went on a. Um... Anyways, I, I, I'm pro <laughs> it. I'm pro it if you can figure yeah. out how to make money from it. Uh, if you don't have a practical use for it. Yeah. So my everyday practical use that <clears throat> I uh, tell people where like the practicality of Bitcoin comes in is like uh here's like here's a good example like you're for example a student from overseas let's say like you originally live in the philippines uh but you know you moved to california to, for school you have a part-time job well let's compare the u.s dollar to you know filipino currency i don't know i don't even know what it's called i'm just gonna say filipino currency <laughs> i don't know i have no um, idea either. yeah so what happens is like student who's working making very little money already wanting to send money back home you know let's say he wants to send like three grand back home from the states to uh the philippines right he's gonna get dinged from the bank like quite hard for that transaction fee right 
if he does that through Bitcoin and then you just go pull it out from a Bitcoin ATM, you're literally losing maybe 10 cents, not even on the transaction hopefully. fee. Hopefully. Like, no, for sure. Like even okay. less than that, probably. Yeah. yeah. But like, no, but here, but here's what's the, the hopeful part? The hopeful well, the part hope- is you're saying the volatility is going to yeah. strike. At, at least when the at least when the bank kicks me in the nuts, I get a little yeah. I get a little piece of paper that says after conversion and after we robbed you blind, mm-hmm. the other person on the other side is getting this come hell or high water. No matter what happens, mm-hmm. whether they cash it now, whether they touch their account in eight months, they're getting this. Yeah. Yes, Bitcoin is a fraction of the cost, but you better hope they use it on the right day. Because of oh, three thousand, well, because, because the three thousand might, might be worth two thousand. Yes, it, it could, could be, be worth four thousand. But like that's where like I, that argument is always fascinating to me. It's like yes, mm-hmm. the bank's going to make seventeen dollars, but at least at least four hundred and thirty three dollars will still be worth four hundred and thirty three dollars tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Or will it though? Because it's still converting to another currency. So yeah, but, but the, the minute you US, sell it, you I get, mean, it's going to yeah. be marginal. But the yeah. U.S. currency is still going to uh, pair. Right with the other foreign exchange, right? So to, totally be, get it. To, to yeah. me, to me, Bitcoin still seems more volatile than that. Yes, it is. Taking, it is. They're, it they're only taking is. that. That's where I was like, I would still do Western Union. You know, like yes, it sucks. I'm getting paid, charged twenty five dollars or whatever, but at least there's no risk. Like it's like, hey, now on the flip side, three thousand dollars might be worth five thousand dollars. And wouldn't you feel great? You know, if you're sending money back home to your country and and the the odds are in your favor, then fantastic. But if you're sending money home and they're banking on that, and because mm-hmm. it can be so volatile, it's half when it gets there. That'd be heartbreaking. Yeah, but you know, you know uh, what? Even if it's half when it gets there, it's still U.S. dollars that they didn't. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> yeah, throwing shit there. Hey, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, no, you know, I, I um, I don't know. It's, it's curious. I'm curious to see how it all pans out. Mm-hmm. But my functionality for it until there's until there's a um, something else that that crosses my radar. It's just a great way to make really fast money. Like yeah. I, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it. I, I was literally buy, like Dogecoin was hilarious. Dogecoin, like you could track when China was uh, playing it, right? Mm-hmm. And it would always oh. happen at it would always happen at four like, in the two morning. In the morning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, four, four in, in the morning. morning. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I would literally <laughs> like I like I literally I showed my wife one day. I'm like, there is no way this is legal. Watch this. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna drop a couple hundred bucks. Perfect. Now it's worth two thousand. Out. And she's yeah. like, that's that's not real. And I'm like, no. And the crazy thing is, because China's got it like a, down to a science, it's a guarantee. Imagine a machine where you put a hundred dollars in, you get four hundred dollars back, and you know it's going to happen day in day out. Yeah. It, it was it, it was like this. It was like you didn't even want to tell anyone because you're like, this is my money. Too. I hated <laughs> that. I hated people. Like I even got messages because I was telling people, I'm like, yo. If you're going to buy into Bitcoin and this crypto stuff before all the hype was happening, I'm like, you need to do it now. Like, yeah. trust me, like, it's a good investment, whatever. And I had friends who were in crypto who were like, dude, stop telling people to buy Bitcoin. Stop it. And I'm like, why? What does it matter? Like, what does it affect you? And it was that thing, like, I don't want other people to know. I don't want other people to make money that I'm making. Like, yeah. and I thought that was so shitty. I'm like, you know what? People don't have to agree with it. People don't have to buy into it. But like, you shouldn't prevent your friends from banking the same bank that you're banking. Like, if anything, yeah. you should be pushing them to also get successful or what or whatever, right? Like, oh yeah, make money yeah. I, or whatever. I I wish I got a royalty from CoinSquare because I was getting everybody in it. But the problem yeah. is, people wait. So mm-hmm. half my friends that got into it got in it like March. Yeah, and and like it was already over. Yeah, the, that's the, the problem. The the dumb people had already lost their money, mm-hmm. and they never went back to it. They're like, "Oh, this was you know, I knew this was crap. I knew this was garbage. Like, yeah. I lost all my money." And then, of course, things started sliding. Right. So then, suddenly, I looked like the heel because they're like, yeah. "Oh, you said you were making all this money, and you're like, you don't understand. Like, it was very real. Yeah. That was no, a, we a we were making money, and still are, to be quite honest. Like, I mean, it goes up and down. It's not. Uh, it actually pumped up during this whole pandemic that everyone's freaking out over all the markets going down bitcoin's gone up from but like that makes five thousand right after it yeah. dipped in covid it went up it's like at ten thousand now us if, you, if people can't get to the bank it's gonna uptick a bit right like people because yeah. it's actually starting to get some practical use so it's uh mm-hmm. yeah it's gonna be interesting definitely interesting. but this brings me to another point mortgages 
Yeah. He's like, I want to talk to you about this. I mentioned to you earlier that I am a huge, well, I'm just not a fan of mortgages and I think that they shouldn't be allowed. And this is my reasoning. Interesting. Okay. And we're going to use hear. the Vancouver market now. Once again, like advocating, I don't know much about real estate. I don't know much about mortgages. You are the expert here. So I'm hoping that you are going to convince me otherwise. Fair enough. But my logic is this. Mortgages allow people to buy beyond their means. And as a result of which, we see things like foreclosures, right? We see things like increased uh, property price, like value, like in Vancouver, Everybody complains that it's so difficult to buy a home. Homes that like would be worthless in other cities are worth millions of dollars here. Why? I blame mortgages. I think mortgages allow people to buy million dollar homes that they can't afford because everyone wants that white picket fence pretty house, right? Yep. As a result of which, it drives the prices up of all the homes and all the properties. And as a result of which, mortgage rates also go up, causing me to spend more monthly, just like you were just saying about how you have to pay $8,000 for your mortgage. Now, if everybody, let's just like assume mortgages didn't exist, right? If mortgages didn't exist, do you think homes in Vancouver that, you know, look like they would be, should only be worth $400,000 would be worth $1 million? I don't. I think it would stabilize the market to a point where there would be fewer buyers, fewer sellers, and within that like good medium, you know, you're going to have a good average price. So a home that maybe is a million dollars now might actually be like $650,000 in that kind of market because people can only buy with what they have and not everybody has a million dollars in the bank. Now, to the latter of that, the only, uh, I guess, downside I could see to that is people can't borrow in order to buy a home that they want. So maybe you don't have $600,000, so you can't even buy that $600,000 home. But in my opinion, it's like, well, too bad, so sad, get $600,000, buy that home, and then it's yours. There's no 20-year payments. There's no interest. There's no running out of money. There's no pandemic that's going to come in. And then you're like, oh, I can't pay my mortgage. What do I do? So that being said, my logic versus you being in mortgages and real estate and all that jazz. Am I right or am I wrong? Be so, honest here. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, no, 100%. So the question is, your, your, your standpoint is like there just shouldn't be mortgages, right? Yes. So B- based on like, the, and I think if there are no mortgages, housing prices would drop significantly, allowing more people there, to actually- There would be. Yeah. There, there, yeah, they would because there'd be no houses. So we're, we're going to play a little game. Okay. So you're, you're now a house builder. Yeah. I want you to build my house. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, need, I need you to build my house. It's going to cost you- probably four or $500,000 worth of material. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have that because no one has that kind of money. Yeah. I need, I need you, Mr. Contractor, you go find a way to pay for all that. And, um, I'll pay back over 30 years. You're cool with that, right? No, I'm not cool with that. You should have that $400,000 to pay me to build How? your house or How? buy the house. How do you have $300,000 in investments? You save it up. You save sure. up. Right now, I'm not asking you, I'm not saying prices will remain the same as they are now and you should get a million dollars. I'm saying that if we do it this way, prices will reduce significantly. And yeah, you're going to have to make or borrow off your family or whatever it may be. But where did they get their money? Yeah, yeah. Because most, most people, most people only have, especially in Vancouver, most people only have wealth because they bought a house for 300,000 and now it's worth $4 million. Okay. Which, 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 so you don't which, think that's a problem? <laughs> well, which brings me to my next point is find a house worth four or five million dollars and ask mm-hmm. what their household income is. It doesn't add up. There's no like the biggest real estate in Vancouver never had a mortgage. Mm-hmm. You ever been to you ever been to Richmond? <laughs> not a lot of mortgages. Okay. Yeah, not a lot of mortgages. 
You know, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of more. Like it's it's uh, all the all the empty homes in West Van. Like I'm sure you've read the Daily Hive and yeah. everything else. All, all 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 the nobody lives there, and there's no mortgages on them. Mm-hmm. I don't think the problem is mortgages. If, if, if actually, to be honest, I think mortgages are the other. Like Canada has one of the lar- the lowest default rates in the world for mortgages. Okay. You can only borrow up to forty percent of your income for a mortgage. That's it. Like it's very very conservative, right? Like mm-hmm. it's there to make sure CMHC exists. That doesn't exist in most countries. CMHC is the government insurance to make sure if there was a collapse, like in the U.S and ensures the banks are made whole on their investments so that our whole system doesn't collapse. So if anything, I would, I don't know, I don't know Canada, Canada personally, personally, like our, our default, default rate is under 1%, 1% on mortgage mm-hmm. defaults. You know, you know like, like it's, it's I, I don't, don't, people aren't getting themselves into trouble uh, from, mortga- from mortgages, where people are getting themselves in trouble, especially out here in Vancouver, I've noticed is, and we've met a lot of these people, they bought their house for, 450,000 seven years ago. Now it's worth 1.5. And they go and get lines of credit and everything against the house and pay cash for Range Rovers and a bunch or or put big down payments on these things mm. to start you know they, they they bury themselves in payments. So I don't know. I I don't know that look at my situation. My because of a mortgage, I get to keep more money in my family and I get more yeah. house. You know? Yeah. So I I think um it is really, really hard. Don't forget, it, it's you would talk about the, well, we're giving people millions of dollars. Ask any of your friends if they have 20% down to get a million dollar mortgage. Chances are a vast majority of them, the answer is no. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not mortgages getting people in trouble. In, in my, in my um, and I hope, you, like, in not even biased opinion, um, yeah. I think if anything, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that you could pay $4,500 for rent 43, look at my situation. It, it, it pains me that a city is so broken that I have to pay $4,300 in rent with no equity growing whatsoever. Yeah. I spent a year here and I get nothing for it. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. At least, at least, so look at my situation now in Langley, $75,000 down. My, my, my rent goes down, so my family gets net $200 more in their pocket. And if I stay there for two, three years, you know the market better than I am, still relatively new here. You know, if I if I stay there for two, three, let's say I stay there five years, it's gonna appreciate two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So my money actually did something for me, right? Yeah. Um so yeah, I, I think it's Vancouver's a listen, Vancouver's a really, really tough market to have this type of like soul searching, like the benefits of mortgages. But if we go back to like Manitoba, for example. You know, you're buying a place for two hundred thousand. You need a ten thousand dollar down payment, and you could live in a probably two thousand square foot house that's maybe only twenty, thirty years old. So you can renovate, do whatever you want for it, and your mortgage payment is a thousand dollars, where you'd have to rent that same house for probably fifteen to two thousand. So I, I think in most cases, you know, what gets what irks people, and uniquely in Vancouver is the younger generation in Vancouver, unless your family bought a house, you don't have a hope in hell mm-hmm. of buying, buying a house here. And and I that pains me. Like as yeah. I, as we as we started making friends here our age, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that anyone our age unless they had a fa- unless they had parents or grandparents that bought a house here, they grew up accepting the fact that they were going to be renters for life. Mm-hmm. And that was a concept that I couldn't wrap my head around because I came from a place where like, literally you graduate high school, um, you do university, which in Manitoba wasn't expensive and like 10,000 bucks, hell you get, you get that for your presentation, getting married. So like yeah. by the time you're 23, you're owning a house and that was everyone's right kind of thing here. It's like, unless the generational stars aligned, you don't have a hope in heck. Um, so to true. answer your, what, what's at, what, you know, and, and trust me, it's very cautious to say, cause I know the hot topic in Vancouver is foreign money is driving up, is driving up the real estate costs. So there, there's the elephant in the room. I said it, there is a lot of that definitely, but there is just as much, uh, people, people that, that have no business, business in the houses house they're, they're in now. now, you know, I think a one and the 300,000 I'm using as a, as a, as an actual real example, there is someone I know that they bought their house 30 years ago for $300,000 is now worth $3.5 million. Oh, wow. 
they don't qualify for a traditional mortgage because like, okay, fine. They bought a 300,000. They still only make 75 grand a year, mm -hmm. which, which is a respectable living, but they don't qualify. Uh, they don't qualify for a traditional mortgage in a Canadian, in a traditional Canadian banking sense. But then there's things like private lenders. So now they've bought a $4 million house with a $4 million price tag. They put $2 million down. Banks still don't want to do it because banks are like, you don't qualify. We're not putting you in this situation. But then there's things like private mortgages that are like, yeah, sure, we own half the house. So here, you figure out how to make the payments on it. Worst case scenario, you don't make the payments. We'll just take the house back. That's where it gets dangerous. That is okay. not what we do. You yeah. know, that, that, and it's unique to, to here and maybe Toronto. It's cute that Toronto oh, thinks, thinks they, they have the most... Uh, expense to real, real estate and then and i, then I bring, bring somebody from toronto, torono here and i'm like oh that's adorable see, see that, that see that empty lot on granville yeah that's five million dollars thanks <laughs> it's, here's uh, another question that i have for you when it comes to expensive yeah. real estate and we'll probably wrap it shortly because i know we're probably over on time with you um okay so people talk about real estate in vancouver being expensive or you know like gentrification and all this stuff and i'm in my opinion, that's just something that comes with a city growing, like any city growing. You go to uh, New York, like Manhattan, for example, a parking stall in Manhattan will run million you bucks. a million dollars, yeah. a million dollars. So, of course, over time, as any city and infrastructure grows, uh, you know, property value and the value of that city tends to go up right and especially as that city gets more dense and more people that value continues to climb we see it with shanghai uh london new york san francisco all these areas why is vancouver any different and why do people here tend to complain about these outrageous prices when they know it happens everywhere and it's just inevitable in my opinion it comes it's like Yo, if you can't live, like, if you can't afford to live in the city, like downtown in the city, okay, then move. Go to Langley. Go to De Delta. Go go somewhere else and make that community thrive. And then when that prospers and grows, you'll have the same sort of. You'll be in the same position as this Vancouverite is who bought his house generations ago and is now, you know, for two hundred k or something, and is now sitting on a million dollars. You could do the same thing just further down the street, for example. Yeah. Am I off on that? Is that kind so of like... A, it, I, I agree with the sentiment, but it comes down to one word, entitlement. Okay. If you were born here, you're like, it is my right. I shouldn't be forced out. But, no, it's not So let's, right. talk, let's talk about London, <laughs> London, New York, and Vancouver. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, a man, I'm a Manitoban. Here, here, here's what people miss out on. The prices are high in those places because people are willing to pay a premium to live there. Exactly, exactly. I come from Manitoba where it's minus, I kid you, like Google this, I'm not kidding. Twice mm -hmm. last year, it was colder in Manitoba than it was on Mars. That's crazy. I will pay an absorbent amount of money to never experience a winter again. Mm -hmm. I will. And guess what? I do. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason that I can move back home and live in a 6,000 6, square foot house and not and not break eight hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. I will live in a house one quarter the size and pay a million dollars here, because it means I'm always warm. I've always got trails. I can smell the ocean, and I can dip my feet in the sand anytime I want. Yeah. If you, it's like anything in life, shoes, cars, anything. You want the best, it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. just, I, I, I'm, that's just how it works. Totally in that boat. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. I, you know, I can't afford to live downtown Vancouver. I'm a lover of Vancouver. I'll never leave this like city or this area. I have a problem with people who say, I can't afford to live down there. Gentrification, you know, foreign buyers. All this. I'm like, dude, move, move somewhere nope. else where yeah. you can afford it. Do you buy a car that you can't afford? No. Do you buy a shirt that's $80 when you can only afford the one that's 20? No. So why do you think that you're allowed or... I shouldn't say aloud. Why do you think that you should be able or capable to buy a home in a city that's thriving like mad yeah. now, especially yeah. when you see all these other major cities, the same thing has happened. Go in history, go in time, go to all these other cities. 
that had approximately the same population at the same time as Canada per ratio per capita, whatever, you're going to see roughly the same prices. Maybe Vancouver slightly higher because it started a little later uh, in the trend. But San Francisco, you know, L.A., New York, we've seen that trend happen time and time again. So when yeah. people say that this is crazy, that this is happening in Vancouver, no, it's not. It's every day, everywhere. And if you can't afford to live here at the end of the day, to me, it's just like, yo, move to the burbs. Go grow that community. That's the whole point is people who can't afford to live here can go live here close enough and you could still thrive and you could grow that. But they community. want everything. You could be yeah. that million dollar homeowner down the road 10 years from now. But they want everything. They want to exactly. be on the sea. They want to be on the seawall with half a block yeah. walk. They yeah. want the trendy nine dollar coffee because it gives them a sense of identifying, identifying who they are. are. Right? Like, like, damn, damn it, it, I should be allowed, be allowed to, to have, have it. It, it, it reminds me of a concert. concert. It's, it's like a concert. concert. You, you want, want to sit in the front, front row? Guess what? If you want the best view? It costs you an awful lot of money. Definitely. You can go sit in the back, but it's up to you. Yeah. So you can still be at the concert, but it's like, how close do you want to be to the stage? The closer you want to be to the stage, which is where all the action is, where the ocean is, everything else, it's going to cost. It's just, and because just because you're not willing to pay it and you feel butthurt, guess what? There's 100 people behind you that are going to pay more than you to get you out of the way because they want it. You know, and, and, and yes, unfortunately, some people just have more means and that's going to bump you. But that's no different than a concert. You know, like you could sit front row for Jay-Z, but if you don't want to part with 800 bucks, then guess what? You're going to be in the middle of the row. Yeah. Uh, I have no problem with people who have the money, whether they be foreign or local. Yeah. If you have the money to buy something, I don't think anything should hold you back. No. And if no. you don't have no. the money, stop bitching about it. Go get the money and buy it. Let's link it back to where we started. Remember with yeah. like the parents and everything else using kids as, as, as yeah. excuses? and Or just accept the fact that it's not meant to happen for you. Totally. You know what I mean? Like, like, you might love your job. And this is what kills me for people. People might have a job they absolutely love, but then they're relentlessly angry that they're never going to be able to afford the $5,000 a month rent. Mm -hmm. Like focus more on why are you not okay with just the fact of where you live? You know, like, I don't know. It's just that like, you're not meant to live there and that's okay. And the minute you can digest that, you'll feel so much better. You know, but but I get it. You know, I get it. Like I lived downtown when I first moved here. I had a sub penthouse right on the corner of Butte and Melville, where I woke up every morning. I let I stepped out of bed and I literally sat there looking at the ocean and the mountain. Nice. I would pay a premium to have that. Now, yeah. not with kids, because all I picture is my kid being able to open the window and you know whatever. But Kirsten, my wife, knows. She knows like the minute the kids leave the nest again, that I'm going to be gunning for there. But I'm going into it understanding that literally Vancouver is a global stage. Totally. Where people people from all over the planet are like, I will pay whatever I need to pay to live there. I'm going into it accepting the fact that, yeah, it's going to cost me a boatload, but that's a choice. I don't. Mm -hmm. To your point, I don't have to live there, but where you need to get to is, okay, fine. If you decide you want to, you have to accept the fact you're going to spend more, and that doesn't give you a right to complain about it. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, everything in life is a choice right but Definitely. man we can talk forever i'm like i know I'm dude this. we got to do another podcast with you we're gonna end it off uh here but i'm gonna ask you what's next for chris so what's next for chris uh is a couple things so on the centum side uh actually today uh we just closed on an acquisition of one of our competitors so we oh, closed nice. on a yeah we closed on a uh, a national broker brand uh, they do three billion dollars in uh, in annual mortgage volume, so that's going to come really close to doubling up our size. We that's been that's been in the works for seven eight months now, and uh, yeah, during COVID, we're closing this acquisition. So the industry actually doesn't. Even, the, the reason I asked is like this is not even public. This hits this hits press releases uh, Monday kind okay. of thing. So um, extending some trust there. Um, Don't worry, so, I <laughs> yeah. So on the Centum side, uh, that that's what's next for Centum. Uh, RPM, we're ever expanding. We didn't even get into it, but like property management right now, like people that are renting, um, mm -hmm. there there is a whole world of opportunity because of what's happened. So we're going to be leaning into um, how do we evolve that. What's next for Chris on the business side is our parent company. We own Century 21 Canada, Century 21 Asia Pacific, uh, um, Uniglobe Travel, which is a travel franchise organization, Centum and Real Property Management. So my, um, what really excites me these days is, wait a minute, in, in our parent company, we control the buying and selling, 
the financing and the property management mm -hmm. in three different brands. And technology has never, never been more innovative on systematically integrating things. things. How, How do, do I create a user, user experience for the Canadian real estate consumer that the world has never seen? And uniquely, I'm set up to do it. Nice. Because the three, so that's what excites me. That's like, and, and you know, like that. That's that's a white. Every day is a whiteboard, right? What can we mm. do? So that's what excites me. On the personal side, gonna get moved to Langley, get settled in, and um, twofold. One, I'm falling in love with like me again. So like fitness and everything else, I'm feeling good about myself. So that's been a really cool adventure. Um, but then just just being a dad, you know, like that's that that's my thing. It's like, it's like like Piper, Piper my daughter Piper, Piper is at an age now, now where. She's got a personality and, um, you know, being almost three, there's person, there's a little bit of my wife's personality coming out and then she'll stub her toe or something. You'd be like, Ooh, that's me. You know? So it's like, it's a really fun time. So, uh, what's next for me is just living in that moment because the one takeaway, it was, it was really hard to be upset at a time like this because I'm traditionally on the road. I'm on the road 18 months or 18 days of the month on average when okay. things were normal. I've never had so much family time. So what's next for me is like, you Remember when we were a kid in summer camp and like you didn't start actually talking to people and having fun till like the last day or so? I, I actually never went to summer camp. Okay, never went to summer camp. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! So like, or anything as a kid, like whether you're at a birthday party yeah. or anything, you never came out of your shell and started having fun until it was almost time to go. I'm seriously getting that sense with the whole COVID thing and the isolation thing. I'm like, uh oh, I think this is going to end soon. I think I think some semblance of normal is going to come soon. I want to get all the family time in I can. So I'm putting a lot of emphasis on that. And then uh, and then just telling our story, figuring out how to tell our story, getting louder. How do we get louder and how do we get more effective with it? And how do we, um, uh, Brendan, who's my, he hates this, so I'm intentionally doing it. Brendan is my D-Rock. He hates that line. Um, how do we... How do we figure out what my natural narrative is so that it's when somebody asks like who are you what are you about how are we laying that out as easy as possible that's what's that's what's next for us as right. as and, and I, offline i'd love your input on that because i get that reaction a lot where you're not the first person that's like holy crap that's a book so then mm -hmm. the challenge is how do you make that short form when somebody hits your page for the first time and is like wow, there's a story there that we want to be, that we could potentially be inspired by because that's what it's all about, right? It's so how do we, how do we tell that story in, the, in its best light? But I appreciate the opportunity, brother. I didn't know what to expect going into this and like we just kind of hit it off and, uh, and, yeah, no, and I will I, say from podcasts, I, yeah, like you're like, you're, you're a cut above, man. Like I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't digested a lot of your content, yeah. but the way you control the conversation, the way like you, this is what you're meant to do, brother. Like, this Thank was you. awesome. This was you know great. What's funny is I just did this randomly. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I, everything, all of my videos, everything was just random. I didn't even intend to do anything on YouTube or anything like that. Kind of just happened and then it grew. And then at one point I'm like, you know, I really want to do a podcast. I just kept thinking about it and I never did it. And I had, uh, I have a domain. It was nofuncity.ca. I, I own that domain. And I was always wondering, like, I'm like, oh, I should do something with that domain, like a Vancouver blog or something. And I never, I just, just held it, never did anything with it. And then I decided, I'm like, oh, I'll do a podcast. I'll call it No Fun City. And if it gets enough traction, I'll make a website. I'll put it on the nofuncity.ca website. So now I'm actually in works of getting that website up. Nice. And the podcast will be there might have a merch store and stuff in the end but yeah it's really fun i'm glad i started it i mean we're only 14 episodes in so uh we'll see how it goes but yeah i mean the other day uh joe rogan got that hundred million dollar spotify spotify uh, deal and i'm like man if in 10 years <laughs> <laughs> i could work my way there it'd be great but if not i'm good with it either way like i just do this for as you say, for love, for fun, like you and I because actually have it. a lot in common. I don't like nine to fives, never did, never wanted to work for anybody, always wanted to do my own thing, passion projects here and there, like just whatever, right? Whatever floats my boat. So yeah, that's how this kind of came about and I'm happy with it. And I get to meet cool people like you and Brendan, right? Sure. So, yeah. you know, Absolutely. we should get him a hat that says B-Rock. No, no. He's going to come off mute right away and... It's okay. Yeah. No. 
<laughs> there it is. There it I'll is. get it. I'll send it to you guys. Um, but yeah, dude, we'll for sure have you back because I know like we could have gone on for another two hours. I just don't want to take up too much of your time already. We've been on for two hours, I think. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll let you get going. And actually, yeah, and, I, and I've got a board meeting that started yeah. literally this minute. So it's, there you uh, go. Okay, so get yeah. going. Uh, Chris, thank you so much. Brandon, thank you so much. This is the end of the No Fun City podcast, episode 14. Peace out. Take care, brother. Take care.